And uh, the title of my message today is Showers of Blessing. So let's read this Bible verse that uh, uh, gave origin to the song we were singing during offering. And it's in Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 36. And God says, And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. They shall be showers of blessing. Can you say showers of blessing? How many of you want showers of blessing? <laughs> oh, God. Send those showers. Sometimes we don't, we don't like rain. We, 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 we're, some people are even sad when it's raining. I know some people where I live that are very happy when it's raining. When I go home, I, I, I see the fields, and, the, <laughs> and I know the farmers are happy. When, when they have rain in the right season, in the right time, not uh, too much rain, not uh, uh, absence of rain, but there are seasons in which sometimes we have uh, periods of, of drought in our, in our lives. But during a, a rainfall, it's when vegetation grows. It's when uh, animals are nourished. So rain will refresh the land, and rain causes things to be fruitful. So when God is uh, promising rain, when we're close to his uh, hill, He's also giving us, giving us a spiritual image because in the spirit, rain represents this blessing that comes from God, represents the Holy Spirit, represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into a believer's life. Why do I say a believer? Because God promised this shower of blessing not for humanity, not for people in general, but this promise is for his people. So I, I want to receive those showers of blessing. But sometimes through life we go through dry, dry seasons. It's like a desert. There are seasons in which uh, we, we ask for the blessing and we don't know where the blessing is. So some people will run for the blessing. Uh, some people that learn that the blessing comes from God, they, they go from place to place and sometimes church to church and if there's a preacher in town or even uh, uh, across the border they will go to new york they'll go here they will go there because they want this blessing they want to receive this blessing and as christians we need to understand the source of blessing is the lord and he wants to give us showers of blessing rain in the natural causes things to grow to be beautiful uh, I know we can be sad when it's raining a day like today and we, we're just waiting for the snow. <laughs> and some people don't like showers of snow. Uh, I, I like a white Christmas. I don't like a long winter. But I know it's necessary to have uh, uh, the water that comes either solid or in flakes or, or liquid. We need this water in order to have life. I don't know if you noticed, but the, the price of gas goes up and up. But a bottle of water is still more expensive than a liter of gasoline. And it will be more and more because it's valuable. It's, it's something really important. Water. Now, the first thing I want to tell you is that our heart may cause a spiritual drought in our life. We can blame circumstances. We can blame a, a number of different things. But our heart is really important. In Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, chapter 11, in verse 14, it says, Then he will send the rains in their proper seasons. So th this, is, this is a promise from God. He will send rain in the proper season, the early and late rains, so you can bring in your harvest of grain, new wine, and olive oil. So wealth was associated to rain in the right season, this in the natural. We know in the days that we live in, we're not farmers, so we, we, we're not, we don't necessarily need the rain uh, unless it's to grow in you know, a little vegetable garden in our backyard or something. But we know the importance of rain for nourishment. Now, in the spirit, I want to have God's rain in the right season. Verse 15, he will give you lush pasture land for your livestock, and you yourselves will have all you want to eat. That's a good promise, eh? You like to eat whatever you want? <laughs> Verse 16, but be careful. Now there's a warning. Be careful. Don't let your heart be deceived so that you turn away from the Lord and serve and worship other gods. 
if you do, the Lord's anger will burn against you. He will shut up the sky and hold back the rain. And the ground will fail to, fail to produce its harvest. Then you will quickly die in that good land the Lord is giving you. So we can see the human heart can deceive uh, any person. In fact, uh, Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So our heart, be careful, because God says, I want to bless you. But you can be deceived by your heart. And during this series of messages, I've been talking about the difference between following our heart and following the spirit. There's a huge difference. And if you notice it, if you, if you watch movies, Hollywood has the message of follow your heart. It's in almost every Disney movie, all the movies with, in, with a good story, we say, what a good movie. And, uh, and uh, just because the main character, the main person followed their heart. And time after time after time, we hear this message, just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. I'm here to tell you, if you follow your heart, you'll experiment spiritual drought in your life. Because God intended for us, yes, to have, to have a heart, but a heart according to God. And when our heart is surrendered to God, then our heart will follow the Spirit and not just our feelings. Many Christians, they, lead, uh, they, they, they follow the, just the heart and they'll, they'll say things like, Oh, I feel in my heart that I should not go to church. I heard things like this. Or, uh, I know the Lord called me to serve, but I feel in my heart that this will happen in 10 years from now. Or other statements like this. Oh, I know this person, uh, well, they, they don't ha want anything to do with God or church, but my heart tells me that eventually he or she will come to the Lord. If you follow your heart, you're doomed to be cursed. And I'm going to repeat this. Christians, don't follow your heart. Because the Bible says that the human heart is, is the most deceitful of all things. Do you believe in the Bible? Who's most deceitful? Your heart or the devil? Now you're thinking. You say, oh, it's the devil. No, it's not. No, it's not. The, the devil is the father of lies. He's deceitful. But the human heart, let me tell you, is even worse than the devil. According not just to this verse of Scripture, but to several verses of Scripture that we read both in the Old and the New Testament. So, if we want to really receive showers of blessing, I want to tell you the place where we need to be. There's a spiritual place where we need to walk to. And it's called the Lord's Hill. As we started by reading in Ezekiel, the Lord said, come to my hill. And when you're close to the hill, I will pour showers of blessing. And through the Bible, we have this illustration of God's mountain or the hill, the, the mountain of God. It was on the mountain that God gave the Ten Commandments. The mountain of God is so important. Jesus used to go to the mountain to pray. And he went to these high places to, to pray. Why the mountain? Why the high places? It's not because we're getting close to God, but there's a spiritual meaning. In this sense, today, church is the Lord's hill. So by the, by the simple fact that you came here to church, you're doing a statement. You're saying, I'm, I'm coming to the hill. I want to be where God is. God says, come to me. And as we draw close to God, guess what? He'll draw close to you. So the shower of blessing doesn't happen in a place where we're far away from God. So we need to go to the Lord's hill. Now let me t tell you about a story that happened in the Old Testament with a mighty man of God, the prophet. You know, this prophet was so powerful that when he prayed, fire will come from heaven. He was a, a mighty man of God. And it says that uh, it came to pass after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. God promised 
to send rain. Now, I'm not going to tell you all the details of, of this story, but it happened that because of sin, because of a curse, Elijah prayed and the rain stopped for three years. And if it doesn't rain in a place for three years, there's famine, there's economic crisis, all sorts of bad things happen if doesn't, doesn't, we don't have rain for three years. There's countries in Africa that will go without rain for long periods of time, and this is why we need sometimes to help those populations, because they have nothing. There's no rain, there's no life. Without rain, there's no life. So here we see that God told Elijah to do something. And you know what he did? He prayed for rain. Later in this chapter, chapter 18, verse 41, it says, Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Carmel is a mountain uh, in, the, in, the, in the region of Israel. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. So here's the prophet of God praying, and he's in deep prayer. I mean, he's not just doing a, you know, a petty prayer, Oh, Lord, come and bless me. No. He's doing a, a deep, uh, he's having a deep moment of intercession. He's had on his knees. He's just kneeling down and praying to God, and he sends his servant a little bit further. And he's at the mountain where the Lord commanded him to be. So in verse 44, it says, it came to pass the seventh time that he said, Behold, there's a little cloud out the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and, and say unto Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down. The rain will not stop. So there's a little cloud. And, and the servant says, Well, it's like a man's fist. It's, it's over there, just a little cloud. It seems that it's coming in this direction. But this, this is a man of God. He has faith. He knows he's praying for something that he is entitled to have, rain. He, he knows that he's praying for something very special that will not only bless him, but will bless the land. And even though the, the King Ahab is doing bad things, the wrong things, guess what? It doesn't matter how bad the circumstances are, how bad the curse that was sent against you, when you pray and when you do things according to, to the Lord, you will have the shower of blessing. He prayed seven times, and seven is the number of perfection, of com uh, completion. In verse 45, it says, It came to pass, in the meanwhile, the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. There was a great rain. Israel needed that rain. I can just imagine those people coming down the street and just having the, you know, the rain showering on, uh, uh, over their bodies. They were wet with rain and happy because now poverty was over. The curse was broken. And this happened because someone in authority prayed blessing over them. There's a, a special symbol here. If you want to receive God's blessing, the showers of blessing, it is very important that you understand the principles of spiritual authority. God's blessing will come upon us when we understand who we are in Christ, where we need to be in Christ, and when we trust and we help those that have the difficult task of interceding and praying without giving up. And when, when we support those, then the shower of blessing will come over our life. It's a corporate thing. It will come over everybody. It's what we call in church revival. So Elijah prayed for rain, and they had a shower of rain, black clouds, just loaded with water, and an outpouring of blessing over the land. Now, let me take you to my final point. If we want to receive spiritual blessings, if we want to receive God's blessing over our life, we need to trust God. If we don't trust God, we will not receive anything. In fact, also in the Old Testament, this is my favorite scripture in Leviticus, it's one of those books sometimes we don't like to read because they're full of, uh, you know, stories of sacrifices and laws and names and all these things. But we have this precious passage in Leviticus 26 where, where God promised this. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, walk, keep, and do. Three things. 
It's not if you know my commandments. It's not if you know my promises. But you need to leave these promises. You need to give of yourself. Verse 4, Then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And it continues on and on with promises of blessing. I'm not going to read it all. But it says, And your uh, threshing shall reach unto the vintage, the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, you shall eat your bread, uh, you will live in sa uh, safety, you will have peace, you, uh, you, you, chase, you will chase your enemies, they will fall by your sword. So the promises go on and on and on. God says that I will make you fruitful. So easy. Walk. Live. We need to leave God's commandments. It's not just a matter of being coming to church on Sunday. Because so, some people, they, they, they do all the religious uh, things and they miss something very important. Trust in God. Do you trust Him? Do you really trust God? When you read the promise, do you say, wow, this is for me, I believe in this promise. Or you read the promise and you say, uh, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is true. There's people that even read the promises of God, for instance, promises of healing, and they will even say, oh, healing is not for today. It's over. It was for the time of Jesus and the time of the apostles, but it's not for today. You know what this reveals? Not just ignorance, but lack of trust. You trust more in what you think than in the book that God gave us called the Bible, which has the statutes, the rules, the laws of God, the promises of God, and God says, if you walk by this, rain will come. Showers of blessing will come. I will make you prosperous. I will cause your enemies to fall. A thousand shall fall at the, at the, the right and ten thousand at your left. You shall not be harmed. Those are God's promises. Do we trust Him? You know, some people don't understand trust. Jesus was trying to teach trust to the disciples. And he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Hearts. You see, the heart is what? It's the most deceitful of all things. And Jesus had to tell the disciples, don't trust your heart. Don't let your heart be troubled. You need to go a, a step further and you need to have trust. And you trust Jehovah... Trust Jesus. You, trust the, you, you have trust in the name of Jehovah. Now trust the name of Jesus. Because we are the same. I am the same with the Father. But you need to have trust. You see, some people don't like the name of Jesus. So they'll say, talk about God, but don't mention the name of Jesus. But you know what? I have trust in this name. This is the name above all names. This is the name above all names. What is trust? Let me give you an example. Let's say you have someone in your family who is a drug addict. We don't like to have drug addicts in our family. Thank God my kids are not drug addicts. But let's say I had the child and this child was a drug addict. Will I stop loving him or her? No. Will I have the trust to leave my wallet with my credit cards and money on top of the table. No way. You see, love and trust are different things, but they also walk together. So if you have an addict in your family, you don't trust them with the bank account. Why? Because they're going to spend everything in themselves. They're going to destroy themselves and the family. You love them, but you don't trust them. Or you don't trust them with a certain thing. So trust is very important. Can God trust you? Can God give you something and trust that you will be faithful to what he gave you? Can God, God give you the gifts of the Holy Spirit and trust that you'll use them? Now we need to put our trust in so many things and so many people. Do you trust your doctor? <laughs> huh? Well, he's a doctor. You better trust him. 
If the doctor says, you're going to die, you have a cancer, you're going to die, you can choose to trust your doctor, or if you're a Christian, you can choose to trust God and say, God, I have this sentence over my life. The doctor told me this, but I still believe that by your stripes, I was healed. Yeah. Who do you trust more? You trust anyone? You trust that your boss will pay you the salary by the end of the month? We need to put trust in so many things. You trust the economy? You vote for politicians, do you trust them? Hmm? Why do you vote for them? If you don't trust them. You see, you see how trust is so important. Now, do you trust your spiritual leaders, your pastors? You trust them. Yes. <laughs> if, if you don't, that's your choice. You can say, oh, I don't trust them. I don't trust them. Or, I don't trust anyone. There's people, they don't trust anyone. But, but you see, trust and love are different things, but they flow together. Why was Jesus saying, trust, trust Jehovah, trust God, trust me? Because he wanted to tell the disciples, there's greater promises that you didn't receive yet. But if you want to receive them, you need to trust me. You need to trust in my word. You need to trust me fully. Now, there's an area where we need to trust God also as Christians. And, and God says, I want to see if you trust me. Give me 10% of your income. And we might say, hmm. 10% is a lot, <laughs> you know, I'll give uh, 20 bucks and that's it because it's what I can afford. But you know what God says? If it's the only portion of the Bible where God makes a promise and, and says, put me to the test, test me. He says, bring your offerings and your tithes to the treasure house and put me to the test. And I'll open up the floodgates of heaven. And I'll bring a blessing upon you. So tithing, it's a form of trust. Let's say, let me tell you this story. There's a, a man goes on vacation to Florida. Arrives there and uh, stays there for a two-week period. And he needs to go to a party. So he takes the, his suit to the dry cleaner and uh, puts the suit there cleaning, you know, goes enjoy life in Florida, it's wonderful. Uh, nobody knows him in that little town and he comes back to pick up the suit. And the dry cleaner says, oh, here is the suit. It's uh, $5.50. And the man checks the, the, the shorts, you know, and finds a, a $5, uh, $5 bill and tells the man, Listen, I only have $5. Can I return and give you the 50 cents? And the man says, oh, sure, I trust you. I trust that you'll bring the 50 cents. So the man goes and, and uh, brings the, the suit. He grabs the suit and he asks the man. Now, let me do a question. If instead of having $5, if I had 50 cents, will you give me the suit and trust me for the $5? And the guy says, no way. <laughs> No. <laughs> you see, and the man told him, so you don't trust me, but you are willing to take a chance for 50 cents. See, there's a difference between trust and taking a chance. If I take a chance, I do something, but if it's just 50 cents, what do I have to lose? See, when I came to, to Christ, I was in, in a really troubled moment of my life. I was between life and death. I actually had the death sentence from the doctor, and I thought I wasn't going to live. And when I came forward in an altar call in, my, in, in the church in my neighborhood, and I gave my life to Christ, I gave it all. I gave it all. I said, Lord, here's my life. And he took it. But later... When somebody told me about tithing, I was furious. 
I was furious, not because I had a lot of money, but I thought, they want my money. These people, the church wants my money. And somebody explained, you know, go to the Bible and read the promises. And I went to that book of, of Malachi, and I read this promise about tithing. And somebody told me, you know, take a chance. And I'm not very good at taking chances. It's all or nothing. All or nothing. I wanted a shower of blessing. I wanted God's blessing over my life. So I decided, between me and God, and I said, Lord, for as long as I live, I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give 10% of my personal income. And you know what? Sometimes it's really hard to do it. There's difficult times in life. There's easy times also, when it's so easy, you know. Here's the tithe and above the tithe. But I've learned that it's not about taking a chance. It's not about dipping your foot on the water to see how good it is. You need to dive. You need to jump. You need just to place your life in God's hands. And tithing is just an example where God filters those that trust in him from those that take a chance. Because there's a big difference between saying, God, I love you from all my heart, all my soul, everything I have, I love you. And God says, prove it to me. How can I prove my love for the Lord? It's with my service. It's what, with what I do with my life. I don't give just 10% of my money. I give 10% of my time and more than 10% of my time because I'm a, a pastor. But I wasn't a pastor all the time. But I've decided I want to give my best to the Lord. I want to give him the best. He deserves the best. And when I have this attitude, guess what? I'm moving to the mountain of his presence. And when I'm close to the mountain is where I can expect to receive his blessing. Not only I'm close to the mountain, but I pray. And if there's sin in your life, that sin is in between you and God's showers. So you need to repent and you need to pray. Are we ready for a shower of blessings? Have you ever seen a water reservoir? They built uh, in a shape that will uh, contain the flood waters, the rain, all the, all, the, all the showers are contained in the water reservoir. But before the water reservoir is ready to receive the waters, there's some work to do. There's foundational work. And, and as workers prepare the reservoir, they also have some uh, way of uh, open the floodgates if there's too much water, and they try to contain the, all the water they can. But the reservoir can be up to the top of water, can be empty, it can be completely dry. I've seen water reservoirs completely dried, They're with no water at all, because there's absence of rain. Our life is like a water reservoir. Your heart, when you give your heart to the Lord, the Lord prepares your heart to receive the presence of God, the showers of blessing, the Holy Spirit. Your heart is ready. But you know what? As you give to others, God will replenish your heart. If you just consume that water and there is no shower of blessing in your life, there's not, you know the Holy Spirit, but He's not outpouring, you know, those blessings, those showers, showers in your life. You'll get empty. And when you're empty, there's only one that can fill the reservoir. His name is Jesus. He's right here. He knows your heart. And it's not when we put the mask of religion that we will receive God's blessing. We need to have trust. We need to trust God. Do you trust God? And you know what? God says, trust God, trust also the prophets. <laughs> That's the reality. Trust the prophets. Who are the prophets? You know, a prophet, it's not a... a you know, we have this idea of the prophet with a long beard and, uh, uh, you know, dressed 
in a funny way and doing funny things. A prophet is someone who speaks God's oracles, who speaks the will of God. In this sense, we can all be prophets. But in the church, God places people in authority to bring the word of God, the word that we need, the word that will bring fruit into our life, the word of encouragement, the word that will bring you out of the pit, the word that will bring those showers of blessing over your life. And God wants to bless you today. Put your trust in him and decide to trust also those that God appointed in authority. You know, in our province, people have a huge problem with authority. It's big. They have a problem with religious authority. It's here in our province. It's part of the territory. I mean, if I go to Bible Belt in the United States, wow, what a blessing. There's a church in every corner. God is blessing. We see miracles. You know, churches have funds. They're packed with people. What an amazing blessing. Certain areas of the world, the world is different. And we happen to be in an area of the world where religious words are curse words. As far as I know, it's the only uh, area of the world, as far as I know, where a religious word is a curse word. Where if you say tabernacle, <laughs> you cannot say that. Not only that word, but numerous other words. What does that show? A lack of trust. A lack of trust in everything that is religious. And you know what? You live here, you're contaminated with this. Either you like it or not. You can say, no, I'm not. But you're immersed in a society. And we need to break free out of this attitude. Ezekiel 34, 36, it was our verse. And I will make them... 26? Oh, I have the wrong reference. 34, 26. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Let us all stand.